Welcome to all of you gardening enthusiasts, whether you are a novice or a geek. We are glad to have you <laughs> listening uh, to the show. This is Mid-American Gardener, and we're going to answer some of the timely questions that you have. My name is Diane Nolan, and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois on the Urbana campus in the Crop Sciences Department. So I'll answer questions about cut flowers, maybe landscape, something like that. But I have three folks with me, and they look highly intelligent. So let's find out who they are and what their expertise is. And I'm gonna start with you first, Chuck Voigt. All right, I am Chuck Voigt. I'm from the Crop Sciences Department. I'm a vegetable and herb specialist. Mm -hmm. uh, teach a class in home horticulture. Uh, <clears throat> and I kind of love amaryllis. And it seems like the last two times I was on, we talked about amaryllis. The viewers had questions and mine are doing so nicely. Uh, for the class, I had enough of them this year that I did sequential starting. So I, every, wow. every week I do one of each color and uh, they've just been going great. Um, I think a long time ago I talked about the seedlings that I raised and all 10 seedlings flowered this year. Uh, this, is, this is one of those. Um, you know, with Annamarillis, uh, they're one of the easier things to rebloom, really. But you have to remember that the flower comes up, does its thing, and then the leaves come up after that. And the leaves are what are, are really, really, really important for next year because they're the ones that are soaking up all the energy that gives the bulb the strength to put up one and hopefully two uh, bloom stalks for, for the following year. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm blessed because I have, I keep mine in the greenhouse, but I also take them out during the summer and that's when they really soak up energy and, and when you see a big increase in size and, and you can rebloom them there and you, you, about the time they would frost, you can, you can, sometimes I've even let them frost, but you can bring them in, tip them over on their side, let them dry out for what, about eight weeks, six or eight weeks, I think Kelly said on a program that I, that I watched. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly having them on their side reminds you not to water them, which you wanna keep them dry. And uh, I, it, it seems to have some sort of a physiological effect. They seem to, they seem to force better after they've been on their side and I don't understand that, but um, it's one of those wonderful magical things that happens with, with plants and flowers. Uh, you know, you look at these things and, and, and just the detailing on, on this one is, is so spectacular. And this scarlet red is, is amazing. It doesn't even bother me that nine of the 10 seedlings are that color um, because it's just such a spectacular color. It's great how the, the bicolor has just one large stalk with lots of flowers, but the red one has two stalks, so you're the, gonna get... The seedlings have been doing that. They've been doing two stalks with only two flowers each, so I don't know if that's, if that's something start. that would be weeded out if you grew a thousand seedlings, oh. or if, if they're just building up their... their uh, but in a way you get longer flowering time. Yeah, absolutely. Boy, those are very beautiful. I like the comment about, it's really important about the leaves, and that's what people need to remember for bulbs right now, for daffodils and tulips. Don't mow them off too quick. That is the important part of the daffodil season is letting those leaves get all of the photosynthesizing sugars back in the bulb. Okay, that was my little bulb and <laughs> advertisement there. I'll back up here so that people can see Kelly. Okay, very good. <laughs> Speaking of Kelly, let's go to you next. Kelly Alsup in the middle. Hi, uh, my name is Kelly Alsup and I am a horticulture educator for Livingston, McLean, and Woodford counties. Uh, my ma my uh, background is in greenhouse management. I actually used to grow amaryllises for Diane Nolan's yes, uh, you did. floral design class for her topiary uh, lesson. And, uh, but- uh, They were gorgeous. Yes, so my uh, experience, greenhouse management, uh, indoor plants. I also love talking about organic pest management, pollinators and butterflies which actually leads me to my first question. And my first question is about gardeners most detested uh, insect in the, uh, and that is a Japanese beetle. This, mm. this lady has had, she has a bunch of roses and the Japanese beetles have been attacking them every June and July. And she's tried a shop vacuum, uh, cool. some pheromone bags and uh, doesn't want to use a pesticide. 
And um, I do uh, agree that uh, I, I wouldn't want to use a pesticide on Japanese beetles either because when Japanese beetles are out, which is in the midsummer, they are feeding on flowers. Uh, they are also feeding on the same flowers that bees are feeding on and butterflies. So uh, using pesticides, you could potentially kill bees. So one of the things that I love talking about is when you're going, if you would like to do organic pest control, one of the best um, methods is exclusion. So what we do with um, organic vegetable gardening is we use this white cloth called uh, a floating row cover. And so we just cover up the crop for the first five or six weeks, weigh it down. Sometimes you can actually put a, um, you know, weigh it down with some bricks. Sometimes you can put a, a, a what I'm, what's the word I'm trying to say, a trellis to keep it up off of the plants. Mm -hmm. And then you uncover it when it needs to be pollinated. And so what I would do is during Japanese beetle time is I would actually cover my roses with this floating row cover. And that would be really the only real way to be organic with Japanese beetles. Another thing that I've uh, seen a lot of gardeners do is cut off their roses just to prevent the Japanese beetles from being lured there. I've heard several people say that. That is a, that's, that would be hard yeah, to that's do. Yes. They'll go for the leaves too. <clears throat> Well, that's true. Yeah, I, I'm so old. I remember when we thought rose chafers were a horrible pest on roses and other things. And the Japanese beetles came in and kind of pushed them aside. <laughs> nobody so talks about nobody them. Nobody talks about them yeah. anymore. That's They're right. Scourge. I <laughs> actually think we're seeing lower numbers than usual in mm -hmm. Japanese yeah. beetles. Something's going on. Yes. Well, I hope so. Yeah. They need a certain amount of moisture at, mm -hmm. at the end of their active season to be able to oviposit and get the, get the, the eggs in the in the ground so that they can grow and it's it's one of the few benefits of a really dry late summer is yeah. is, is that is that it cuts down japanese beetles the following yes. year i and think i, I saying remember it. phil saying it was seven inches of rain like, that they needed um, i didn't remember the exact amount in I know the he says late summer from july when they start oh, depositing their eggs Labor Day in or your something. lawn yeah. yep. and that is usually something we don't always have it's a great reason not to water your lawn. Yes, it really a is. Very good reason not to <laughs> water your good. lawn. That's what he said. Originally, they thought they wouldn't go past a certain into the dry plains, but because of irrigation and people watering their lawns, they've traveled they way further than it. people ever thought they would. Oh <laughs> boy! Well, that's very interesting. Thank you very much, Kelly. And now let's go to my immediate left to Rusty Malding. Hi there, Rusty. Hi, Diane. Thanks for having me again. You're welcome. Uh, my name is Rusty Malding. Um, my wife, Corey, and I own a, own a uh, landscape company in Watsika, Nature's View. Uh, I happen to also be a um, uh, vice president for the Illinois Landscape Contractors Association. Um, so Which means someone next to me may be president in the summer and going on into the year after that. That's, that's the idea. Yeah. Yes. So hopefully when I come back, I'll be president. Okay, very good. So today I have a, uh, an email from a viewer about a weeping cherry tree. Um, they've sent a couple of great photos in. It shows this great um, split right down, the, uh, right down the middle of the bark. And they're asking what they should be doing about it. So there's, there's a couple of things you see here. But um, first off, the, the vertical split like that, it appears to be on the south face. And that is a classic sign of a frost crack. Uh, it's something that happens in the winter when the, the temperature from the sun hitting the bark um, when on, on a cold day it heats it up and you get this fissure, this, uh, this sort of uh, cracking that happens in the bark. There's very little you can do to protect it other than potentially wrapping it uh, on young trees. On, this is a little bit of an older tree, uh, it's probably been on the ground for 10 years or thereabouts. Um, so not much you can do to prevent it. Now that it's there, what do you do? Um, really not much you can do. Uh, you know, some people, you know, it's, it's there, oh my gosh, I gotta do something. I'll go out and I'll buy some pruning paint put on there. It's really Ooh. not gonna do anything good for you. Uh, if anything, you actually may have made it worse. So let it be. Um, the thing about weeping cherries, uh, and this is sort of one of those uh, love-hate relationships, um, weeping cherries are really not a very long-lived plant. We're slightly out of their comfort zone, and so 15 to 20 years in a weeping cherry is probably about all you're gonna get. So 
Um, best thing you can do is keep it well watered in the summer. Uh, instead of watering your lawn, water your ornamentals. <laughs> 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 keep it mulched, which um, this, um, this viewer does have mulch around it. Um, the other thing that I noticed, which struck me as odd, if I can uh, just diverge just for a moment, sure. is this picture looks like it was taken in the spring, uh, probably in March this year. And I noticed that all of the weeping branches have been trimmed off. Um, that's, that's fine um, horticulturally to do that in the winter or in the off season, but um, you've just removed all the blossoms for this spring. So it's probably leafing out right about now and you're probably not getting the opportunity to see the beautiful um, cherry blossoms that are sort of ubiqu the ubiquitous <laughs> for having the plants. Um, so trim them after they're flu fl through flowering and then kind of let it be after that. Okay, boy, that's a rough go. Mm. I noticed you said mm. this great crack and most people would say, oh, but it is very <laughs> prominent. It yeah. did show up well. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, let's go to a promo that we're going to be talking about for Mid-American Gardener next. Hi, I'm Diane Nolan, host of WILL-TV's Mid-American Gardener. On Thursday, May 28th, join us for a jam-packed afternoon of gardening fun. First, we'll hop on a bus and head over to Danville Gardens and then Country Arbor's Nursery for special demonstrations by Master Gardeners. Both nurseries will provide a discount on items you purchase that day. After that, it's back to WILL for dinner and then on to the TV studio where you'll be part of the first ever live studio audience in Mid-American Gardener history. We'll take your questions along with emails from our other viewers. After the show, stick around for dessert and conversation with me and my panel of experts. For information on how you can attend, visit will.illinois.edu slash willtravel or call 217-333-7300. Do you love the smell of fresh cut grass? Well, the smell of freshly cut grass is actually a plant distress call. I think the live studio audience is going to be fun. We're looking forward to that. Okay, let's go to the phone lines and start with Larry's question about peppers on line one. Hi there, Larry. Line one. Larry, are you there? Okay. Uh, yes. Yes. Hi, Larry. What's your question? Oh, uh, I have really two questions about peppers. Okay. When, when transplanting them, should they be planted deeper like tomatoes? And also, I love to brag about early vegetables. <laughs> should, does it really help to, to pinch off the first blossoms? You have got the guy who's going to answer <laughs> these questions. Take it away, Chuck. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Yes, you can plant peppers a little a little deeper than they've than they've been growing. Uh, they probably won't root in as as much as a tomato might along the stem, but uh, if, if especially if they've gotten a little overgrown and tall and, and maybe lost their lower leaves, uh, it'll make them a little uh, steadier in the ground. And and if they do root in some more, I think that that that's a good thing. Are we talking a half inch inch, something like that? It, it depends, you know, if but if not if a lot. if you've got you know. 18 inch pepper plants and all the leaves are up here, you can probably go more than that. Okay. If, if you start to go more than a couple of inches, you probably want to do a, like a 45 degree mm -hmm. diagonal okay. um, so that you don't get the, the stem buried too deeply. Okay. Um, as far as blossom pinching, um, again, if, 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 you, if you go crazy and have one that's blossoming while it's still in a cell pack or in a pot, uh, those are the ones that are probably best uh, to get rid of, you know, if if you really want to brag about something, leave one with 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 one of those little peppers on it and brag about that one. But for the rest of them, pinch them off because it it really enhances the architecture of the plant and how quickly they get up and grow. And and your your subsequent yield is going to be much much greater if if you go ahead and sacrifice that first one because while it's trying to mature that first pepper it's not putting on branches it's not putting on leaves it's just kind of chugging along trying <laughs> to get to get that one little undersized pepper uh, mature very good i did not know that about the pinching very good 
All right, well, thank you for that question. Let's move along to uh, Frances's question about her yard on line two. Hi, Frances. Hi, I'm on line two. My name's Sue. Um, oh, hi, Sue. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I've had a lot of trouble this year. I moved to a new place, and I planted like two dozen tulip bulbs. I have three of them. The squirrels have the rest. And I'm wondering, other than fencing them, what sort of deterrent I could use for next year? And also, what sort of perennials could I plant that they would leave alone? Well, I know that daffodils, nothing really bothers daffodils. So I have thousands of daffodils. <coughs> Me too. And I don't have that many tulips, although I do have a couple tulips that are 20 years old, but you know, a section. But daffodils, they don't mind. Yeah, I, I think it was your friend uh, P. Allen Smith I saw put down chicken wire over yes. him after he planted them. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then I, I don't, you might be able to take it up or you could just, they might even grow right through it. I don't know. Uh, I think it would the, grow the other it. thing he recommended was as you plant them, uh, make sure that any little pieces of, of skin or shell or whatever that thing that around the bulb, you pick that up so that, that it doesn't give them a scent cue to mm -hmm. then go over and, 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 and dig them up. But something that excludes them is probably right. in order someplace where they've already got a taste for them. I actually tried something this past uh, oh, good. past winter. Um, we had a client who had a, a couple of large oak trees in squirrel's heaven, you know, so they were just running about every, everywhere. And um, we interplanted the tulip bulbs with um, some allium. Uh, Allium Summer oh, yeah, Beauty, uh, sure. and it, I just it, same thing, masking sort of the scent of the tulip bulbs, and um, so they don't like the onion scent, they don't smell the da the tulips. Exactly. They don't like daffodil scent either, probably. Seems to work really well. Boy, that's a good hint. I do have one section where Allium has self sown the Allium Christophii, the big mm. star of Persia. Mm -hmm. Nothing messes with that garden. Hmm, I never <laughs> even thought about it. Because yeah. they almost smell more like garlics than 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 onions. Yes. So they're really. Right. Hmm. <clears throat> Very good. So hopefully that gave you some ideas. Uh, you can get tulips, but and the tulips they don't bother are in a very closely planted bed with periwinkle, hmm. um, queen of the prairies, a rose bush. There's I don't think they could get through to dig <laughs> yeah. it, you know, because there's a lot of roots <clears throat> and everything does well. So well, thank you for that question. We appreciate it. Let's go on to our line three question um, on. Ba bagworms and hi we're going to say hello to Cheryl. Hi um bagworms help. And what about them? Well um oh there's that echo again I'm sorry. Just um, listen to me you'll be fine. Okay I have a tree actually three and uh two feet uh, these are um, evergreen and about two feet up on this one three are together, but the bagworms are just killing it. Is it a really tall? Are they really tall? Um, no. Uh, they're, I'm going to say five feet. Oh, okay. okay. All right, Rusty. Can, can you can you actually still see um, the bagworms on the um, on your evergreen? I'm guessing you probably have an arborvitae or, or maybe a, uh, a juniper of some sort. Yes. And there are three planted together in the middle ones. Um, a little bit taller than the other two, and um, they're about two two feet up on this one. That the bagworms I see, and they're just I don't know. Do they eat? Well, okay. So all the damage you're seeing, they did last fall, last late summer and early fall. And what you're seeing now is either the empty the empty pod from the males who have escaped to go seek out females, um, or the females that have laid their eggs, and that will be the new crop. So the best thing you can do, especially with a relatively small evergreen uh, or shrub or whatever it may be, is just to pick them off. Pick them off, throw them away, get them the heck out of there, uh, and do it, do it now before they hatch. They'll be hatching in about a month and a half, uh, I think in early June. Uh, so get rid of them now, and that should help um, next, uh, along about mid-July, start scouting. And if you see a little itty bitty, what look like, you know, little bitty pine cones starting to squirm about that are only a quarter inch, uh, three eighths of an inch long, go ahead and you can hand pick those as well. It's a great, great control method to get rid of those. And if it hasn't done too much damage, your plant should recover. 
And it's a short tree, so that is perfect. Yep. But I know people who pick them off and just drop them at the base of the, <laughs> of the shrub, and that yeah. just says, oh, well, you're going to emerge from up. another area. <laughs> <laughs> so, right. so make sure you get them off site. All right, well, thank you for that question, and always get bagworms. I've seen them on uh, stop signs. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know what's a great fun? You, what's that? You're breaking a new crew. You go out and have them pick bagworms, <laughs> and they throw them in the back of the truck, and they come back, and they can like they're like literally coming in like the cab. Oh, <laughs> so the they attack did, of the bagworm. They didn't really learn to remove them completely. Well, it's just a good way to break them in. <laughs> oh, you're <laughs> making them do that on purpose. Okay, I get it. That would be terrible, <laughs> but yet yeah, fun. Okay, let's go to one more, and um, before we go back to the, some emails, and we're going to go to line five, and it's about amending soil. Hello there. Hello. My name is Karen, and my question is, I saw um, on YouTube about amending clay soil with pumice stone, um, you know, a granule pumice stone, mm -hmm. and there's a product called dry stall that is actually a, you know, a form of pumice stone that is used in horses, um, you know, stalls. And do you know anything about amending your soil with pumice stone? I did part of my master's degree on pumice stone, <laughs> so yes, oh, I did. Oh, great. <laughs> but it was used in a greenhouse setting. I can't imagine that that would be overly uh, cost effective. I would think that mm. would take a lot of money. Uh, but anyway, I, I mean, if, if you are able to, but it works great. It works like a perlite. It works like a vermiculite. But what I did to amend clay soil that after my new house was built and the clay was put on top, I just used a lot of mulch and compost. Mm -hmm. I didn't add anything like I, the pumice is more for a greenhouse, gar, you know, <clears throat> container soil, and it did work fine. Yeah, I, I don't know about pumice specifically, but anytime you add a coarse aggregate to something like sand or mm -hmm. uh, the British people are always using grit for things. Always. And it's like, <clears throat> I, you, you know, if you've if you've encountered our friend Art Spomer, you know that. The clay fills in between those coarse particles, mm -hmm. and you just get a, a thicker and thicker and, and heavier, heavier thing until you get like seventy percent of the coarse aggregate when there's not enough. And to the fill pumice in before. is to amend good <clears throat> garden loam, and you know, so you have peat, perlite, and soil. Right in, in a in a in a greenhouse pot setting, it, it it's would be fine, but outside. It, it makes me a little nervous that, that you might not be making the, the situation all that much better. Certainly sand is not something that you add. Right. Which she did not <coughs> say sand, so that she, was She did perfect. not, I was, I was pleased was when wonderful. she did not say sand because uh, you hear that so much. Oh yeah, I put a little sand in it to lighten it up. Well, no, you made it even heavier because it's like adding coarse aggregate to concrete. But I did mm. it in a slow way, so it took five years to really get the clay and my, oh, yeah. now the soil is wonderful. Or, organic matter works wonders yeah. with, with heavy soils like that because it, it forms secondary structures mm -hmm. so that it actually, uh, you know, you, it drains much better because you have lots of clay particles clumping together, you know, mm -hmm. because the organic matter has, has like little glues in it that helps to do that. So it's, it's a great thing, the, the organic matter. Um, it, it is, it's not something that happens overnight, though. It's a no. four, five, ten year type process. It, it, so just keep on adding the compost. Keep on adding your, yeah. your uh, mulch. And, and you bring the clay up, and, you, and the earthworms will do the best earth, part. They'll absolutely. just bring it up and, and mix. But it, it takes a while. But uh, the pumice, I think, would be fairly costly and not amended as well as organic matter would. So. Yeah. We're kind of, I have heard this before, but not in an outside so landscape situation. So I'd be a little careful. The best thing to do is um, not only compost, but mulch that has been aged. And I would say in this situation, I am not a fan of colorful mulch. <laughs> do I have anyone who agrees with me at this table? Yeah. Does anyone not agree? We, I am not a fan of the colorful mulch. I just, I think you're adding things to the soil you don't need to be adding. Exactly. And it looks good for, what, a couple months and then it fades? I'm not sure. Do you want someone to look at your beautiful red mulch? Or do you want someone to enjoy your entire My landscape? My plants yes. and landscape. Yes. I feel it looks unnatural. I don't like it either. I think and it's I did a not know I was going mistake. to bring this up. So <laughs> these are unadulterated. <laughs> <That peeves. laughs> but I would say uh, aged mulch 
and you know three inches and kind of down to the plant itself and and that will work in I never remove that aged mulch I never remove it people are always sweep and raking it off yeah. no don't do that so anyway now, you've really hit a chord with us we're enjoying mending soil <coughs> do you add mulch twice a year I basically mulch anytime it gets too low so I often mulch mm, maybe 40 weeks a year a little bit here and there <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if I do a new section, I'll mulch it, but, but no, I don't add just two times a year. Okay. But it's when it's working down into less that I add more. So, and I, it doesn't matter when. Wow, we got carried away on the amending <laughs> soil. <clears throat> Thank you for that question, Karen. That was really fun and important. Thank you three for being here. I appreciate your time, your expertise, and I want to thank all of you for watching. Have a great week gardening. Goodbye. <laughs>